The second method is nitrogen gas adsorption technique. Now, this is where you use a surface area analyzer which is known as autosorb which is contachrome make where nitrogen is used as an adsorbent or adsorbate. So, this instrument works on the principle of BET. You have been hearing the name BET several times. So, BET is a combination of three researchers like Brunner, Amet and Teller. So, in the name of these three researchers, this method has been named as BET and this is reference you can go through whenever you get time, adsorption of gases in multi-molecular layers, Journal of American Chemical Society 1938. So, most of us were not even born at that time when this method was developed, alright. So, this instrument has to be calibrated first with the help of standard reference material. So, normally alumina is used which is supplied by the manufacturers. This is where you use 1 gram of the air dried soil, it is poured in a glass cell and it is degassed under vacuum at 100 degree centigrade for a period of 24 hours. Now, degassing is nothing but removing all the vapors which are associated with the sample and why you are removing all the vapors? So, that the nitrogen gas gets a better chance to get adsorbed on the surface of the particles. This process helps in minimizing the errors which are incurred due to rise of vapor pressure while adsorption of nitrogen takes place. Later the sample is exposed to nitrogen gas corresponding to different relative pressures P divided by P naught where P is the applied pressure and P naught is the vapor pressure at saturation. So, this process ensures optimal adsorption of nitrogen. Incidentally, some of you may get a chance to work in carbon dioxide sequestration in your post graduation or whatever after masters. So, this is where these type of techniques can be utilized for finding out the recharge capacity of the geomaterials when you talk about carbon dioxide sequestration, methane sequestration and you know expensive soils and so on. Kunal, you want to add something here with respect to carbon dioxide sequestration? Yeah. Right now the biggest challenge is how to capture the carbon dioxide from the environment and you know tap it and force it into the aquifers so that environment becomes clean. So, on this lot of people are working particularly in geotechnical engineering, it becomes a multidisciplinary area where people from chemistry background, earth sciences, geologists, geotechnical engineers particularly hydrogeologists, all of them are considering this problem and this is a very good methodology to capture and reduce the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. So, at the end of the test, the sample is weighed on a balance of accuracy 0 0.0001, 0 0.1 milligram basically and the volume of nitrogen adsorbed VA on the sample corresponding to a pressure is recorded and adsorption isotherms are developed. Where do you use the word isotherm? Same temperature. So, here actually adsorption isotherm is a mesonomer is the adsorption response at a given temperature. So, isotherm corresponds to the response of the system corresponding to a certain temperature or certain ambience conditions. So, the moment you change the ambience conditions, your responses are going to be different and they are incomparable. So, that is why we use the word as sorption isotherm, adsorption isotherms, gas isotherms, chemical isotherms and so on. That means, at least one condition is fixed that the temperature remains same, pressure remains same. Further, the specific surface area of the soil is determined by employing a single point BT analyzer known as smart SOB. This is commercial available equipment and for this purpose, the degas sample is filled in the sample holder and is exposed to nitrogen. You get surface area corresponding to single point BET with the help of the software which is built in in the system.
it is a very expensive instrument. A BET would cost something like 50, 60 lakhs, not less than that and a single point BET will cost you not less than 7, 8 lakhs. It is okay. So, if P happens to be the applied pressure, P naught is the saturation vapor pressure of nitrogen, V is the volume of nitrogen adsorbed at a pressure P. We want to measure VLM is the volume of nitrogen required for monolayer formation. Monolayer is nothing but the first layer which gets formed on the system and it is assumed that there will not be any multiple layer formation on the material as such. As per the Langemuir isotherm, Langemuir was a scientist who has given one isotherm. So, in his name, the name of the isotherm is Langemuir. B is the parameter related to maximum amount of nitrogen getting absorbed on the sample. VMBT is the volume of the nitrogen required for monolayer formation using multipoint BT isotherm and CMBT is a constant which is proportional to the heat of adsorption in first and subsequent adsorbed layers. So, Srinivas, this is where actually we can talk about you know heat which is associated with the interaction and this is where we can define the contaminant soil interaction particularly in the form of heat which comes out of the interaction and A mol is the area covered by each nitrogen molecule which again remains fixed. So, using this equation that is if you are finding out the surface area from the Langmuir isotherm or from the multipoint BET you can use the volume divided by the volume of the total system into the area of monolayer. What this will give you is a relationship like this. So, these are known as nitrogen gas adsorption isotherms. On y axis you will find the P upon P naught value divided by the total volume which gets absorbed on the system. All right, And then on the x axis you have P by P naught. So, if you remember the gas equation, universal gas equation, this is PV equal to n into R t. So, here what we are doing is we are plotting this in such a way that P upon P naught is normalized with the volume with respect to P by P naught. So, truly speaking these two get normalized and what you get is only 1 upon V naught. So, that is nothing but the slope of this line. So, this was the hypothesis which was given by Langemuir and the hypothesis which is normally used in MPBET. So, these are the forms of the equations that is P upon P naught into 1 upon V A equal to 1 upon B V L M P naught plus P upon P naught V L M. You need not to remember all this. This is just to expose you again of what type of analysis is done to get the results. You are not supposed to mug up all this information all right. But of course, it should remain in your mind. Somebody ask you yes, you can say that I know how to get these values or the use the instruments or how to analyze the values. This is the third method mercury intrusion porosimetry. We were talking about this type of relationship in the previous lecture. The volume of the mercury which is getting intruded into the system as a function of pressure, applied pressure. So, you get a typical S curve and what it shows is that the pores are very well distributed and there are all sorts of pores which are present in the system. If you think of a situation where you get a vertical line, what will the meaning of that? It is not possible first of all, is it not? It is a hypothetical situation. That means, you require one pressure to fill all the volume. I mean, the system happens to be highly porous, but this type of a geometrical is of no use. Now, what is to be done to get the surface area? You simply integrate the area which is below this curve. So, how integration will be done? P delta V divided by surface tension into cos of delta from 0 to V max. So, from this point to maximum value of the V volume, if I integrate this curve, I will get the surface area which is normally defined as SMFP. Now, my question is this surface area will be total or external or internal? Why external? 
but mercury is going to surround each particle. So, again this is going to be a sort of a external or total? External, only external, all right. No, I am just trying to give you an idea that though mercury is intruding into the system, but as you rightly said, it is not interacting with material at all. So, it is still remains external surface area. Here normally delta is used as 130 to 140 degree depending upon the soil or concrete. Technically when you deal with concrete, the delta value is 140 degree and for soils it is 130 degree. This is the surface tension of mercury, 480 Newtons per meter or 0.48 dynes per centimeter. Now comes the method which is known as ethylene glycol monoethyl ether EGME. Now, this is a very interesting method. 2 gram air dried soil is spread uniformly on the bottom of a glass dish and the dimension of the glass dish are 40 millimeter internal diameter and approximately 20 meter millimeter in height and this is covered with a perforated wash glass so that you can observe what is happening inside. These dishes are placed in a vacuum desiccator containing 250 grams of phosphorus pentoxide, which helps in maintaining a constant vapor pressure inside the desiccator. The sample is evacuated by applying vacuum for 2 hours and is weighed until it attains almost a constant weight. This was the philosophy which we developed to see how evaporation affects you know the fundamental properties of the clay surfaces. Later 6 ml of EGME solution is added to the sample to form a slurry. So, what you are doing is you are allowing soil to interact with a dye. So, this is a controlled material which is reacting with the soil mass. And this slurry is placed in the desiccator over a desiccant. Normally, calcium chloride is used as a desiccant. You must have seen in the laboratory that in a conical flask we have calcium chloride cubes. So, calcium chloride is nothing but a dehydrant for 12 hours. And this helps in maintaining a constant vapor pressure and minimizing the loss of EGME from the monolayer, which forms on the sample and the interlayer spacing of the soil minerals. I have used this word inten intentionally, please go through the sentence again and let me know what type of surface area this method will give you. This helps in maintaining a constant vapor pressure and minimizing the loss of EGME from the monolayer. So, this is the total surface area that means the internal as well as the external which forms on the sample and the interlayer spacing of the soil minerals. So, the beauty of this method is this will give you the total surface area of the soil particles. Initial weight of the slurry along with the glass dish is measured using the precision balance and the dish is replaced in the desiccator for evacuation under vacuum. Evacuation is the word which is normally used to degas the system or take out whatever has been captured by the soil particles. The glass dish is taken out of the desiccator, you keep on weighing it, replacing it unless the weight becomes constant. So, this is the type of result which you will be getting. It is a typical response of uh, soil which is being treated with EGME. On y axis you will have the weight with respect to time. So, this is the initial weight of the system and then as time increases what happens? This weight keeps on dropping and then ultimately you end up with WC. So, here we do two type of experiments. The first experiment is done in air dried samples, another one is done at the decay samples. Why? Because we want to differentiate between the mono layer which has been formed and the inter layer between the particle atoms. So, this way we can get both internal surface area as well as the external surface area. This is part clear. It is a typical drying curve under vacuum suction. If the same analysis you have been doing for the soils, 
you would have found some cracking taking place with respect to time the weight of the system decreases. So this is where we use as total or as external which is nothing but the weight C which is the residual weight of the sample divided by the total weight of EGME which is used. And this weight of EGME which is used to form a monolayer on a square meter of bentonite is given as 2.86 10 power minus 4 grams. So, you can obtain external surface area of the soil by suppressing its interlayer. How this suppression is being done? This suppression is being done in this form when you have degassing being done and the air drying of the sample. For this purpose, the sample is degassed at 600 degree centigrade for 5 to 6 hours under vacuum prior to commencing EGME test. All right. So, this will give you the surface area depending upon which method you are using either air drying or degassing of the sample. So, you can get S total or S external depending upon what you are and the minus of the 2 will give you surface area which is internal. So, let us talk about the air adsorption method, relatively simple method here you can use ultra pycnometer which is again manufactured by contachrome which we have a, which is available in our laboratory. The basic principle of this methodology is that uh, the specific surface area of the sample is proportional to its air adsorption capacity that is the volume of the air which is getting adsorbed onto the surface. And weak air it can be determined by measuring its density using helium gas and nitrogen gas. So, you have to use two gases helium and nitrogen. The contrast between the two densities will give you some parameter which multiplied by another parameter will give you the surface area. So, this instrument is calibrated using the standard reference material and in this case the standard material happens to be stainless steel balls of different diameters. You might have seen when you visited the lab that the calibration is done with the help of steel balls. Why it is so? Why do you use steel balls? Any guess? The most smooth surface, is it not? So, on a most smooth surface, there should not be any adsorption of gases. You take any rough surface where the adsorption will be more than this. So, this becomes a reference mark where adsorption value is going to be almost nil. Later, the air dried sample is degassed at 100 degree centigrade under application of vacuum till it attains a constant weight. Of course, this facility is available in the pycnometer itself, you can degas the system there itself. This procedure ensures complete removal that is desorption of the adsorbed air from the surface of the sample. Now, let me ask you a question, what should be the basic function of a deodorant? Why do you use powder, talcum? What they, what they should do? Yes, what smell they should adsorb within themselves, correct. So, if you want to test a good deodorant, a good powder which is used for cosmetics, you have to do these techniques. That is why these techniques are very popular with people who are doing chemical engineering. I mean, this is their bread and butter, they have to live with these things for everything. I do not know whether you have seen any plant where the nail polishes are being done. You should go to the Lekme Institute which is located in uh, Hindustan Levers. That is the best place to learn geotechnical engineering. What is the requirement for the nail polish? You should remain stick to the nails for a long duration without losing the shining. So, this again mineralogy comes into picture, the bond between the material which you are using and the skin. What is the third property? It should not be toxic hazardous and there should not be any leaching into your blood vessels. So, that means there should not be further diffusion in your blood streams of the system. The same is true with the lipsticks which you guys use. All right. So, the implications are tremendous. 
my earlier batches i used to take them to hindustan livers lakme center where they got exposed to design of all these things including dove and what was the other soap uh, which they use glycerin that brownish color pears yes so how to make a soap which is transparent but still it acts as a detergent so that's the monopoly of the unilever of uk no one else has mastered it yet like the logic another good example i'll give you in the soap industry suppose you buy a soap today and then you keep it on the shelf in your bathroom after two days the entire perfume evaporates would you use this soap or not third day onwards what will happen to the soap industry it will close down on the fourth day <laughs> so that means all these problems require sequential degassing of the you know chemicals which are being input in the matrix at a very slow rate another good example is earlier days when you used to use vim bar it used to lose its physical integrity so it used to be hygroscopic but nowadays you see the technology has changed and this vim bar still remains maintained for its life the third problem is they should not be chemical they should be diffusing out of the salt out of the soap matrix because of temperature difference because of the humidity normally humidity is going to be very high in your bathrooms and all so designing a soap also is a very big challenge it's not a easy task so this is where the magnesium oxide should not leach out of the soaps if magnesium oxide leaches out what does magnesium oxide does in bricks how do you make bricks it's a binder magnesium oxide happens to be a binder if you don't put magnesium oxide it acts like a bending agent at elevated temperature so the physical strength of the soap will come because of the magnesium oxide which is present so if magnesium oxide itself oozes out the soap will crumble so this is where these type of studies become very important where else you can find some applications of these studies fabrics particularly the rugs which normally you use the furs coats and so on is it not so the more air sorbing capacity the more heating and more conducive to wearing and body so these are the applications in engineering where these simple techniques can be utilized to determine their activity so this is a simple equation where you find out the specific surface air surface area by using air adsorption method which is equal to volume of air adsorbed on the system divided by the weight of the material multiplied by some constant beta now v air upon w is nothing but 1 upon rho helium that is the density measured using helium gas and density measured using nitrogen gas so beta basically corresponds to the shape of the particle this is what we have been discussing yesterday that if you want to do the tomography of the particle you know shape and dimension and the type of the soil particle you can characterize by getting the beta value so for different clays it will be different for sands it will be different combination this will be different so on so this surface area will be external surface area how to obtain beta value this is a big question so for determining beta you have to conduct either mbet or egme test so that you can train a relationship like this so this is a technique where you have to adopt two methods the air adsorption as well as egme so egme will give you a relationship like this where a specific surface area is a function of volume of air divided by weight and the slope of this line is nothing but beta so you can obtain beta from here once you have trained the system you conduct this test again get v air upon w multiply these two and you get a specific surface area by using 
clear adsorption method. So depending upon the requirement and the precision which you are looking for, you have to keep on changing the methodology, adopting the environmental conditions and so on. Now, subsequently, we developed some relationships, particularly this credit goes to my PhD scholar Naidu, Dr. Naidu in fact, who did lot of work in this area determining specific surface area of different type of soils by using all these methods. And this paper was published in Geotechnical and Geological Engineering in 2008. You can refer it if you want to go through these processes and complete methodology. What I have presented here is only a gist of the methods, but not the critical commentary. Particularly, whenever you want to use this type of information, you should go through the literature which is available on the methodologies and their limitations. I hope you will appreciate this point that this was the effort where the specific surface area has been directly linked with liquid limit. Are you satisfied with the type of tests you do to determine liquid limit of the soil or you find some difficulty? See the way liquid limit is obtained is a very, you may get erroneous results because two persons doing the same test may end up doing different values. So this is where we realize that uh, SSA should be utilized to determine the liquid limit of the soils and it works out well. What you notice is as the specific surface area increases, liquid limit increases. You agree with this trend? So this side you must be having sands for which liquid limit is very less and this must be active minerals where the specific surface area is extremely high. The basic philosophy is that it ranges between 0, this is asymptote and another asymptote comes on the y axis where the liquid limit could be approximately 800 percent. Now let me ask you a question, what could be the liquid limit for a typical bentonite? Have you ever tested bentonite sample yourself? Never. Anybody? What is your guess about the liquid limit of bentonite? Any number which comes to your mind, Sangeeta? More than 500? Well, we have not come across 500, but here we are very close to 480 something, the one which we have tested, you are right. So it varies from 180, 200 to almost 500. So this is where we got one response. I thought you will observe this value and you can tell. So this is somewhere very close to 500. We did one test. So that is why they are supposed to be very active materials. And incidentally, these are the bentonites which are calcium bentonites, not the sodium bentonites. So this is one utility of doing this type of uh, experiments. You can straight away check the liquid limit by obtaining the specific surface area. You must have come across some literature where they talk about influence of soil contaminant interaction on liquid limit of the soil and plasticity index of the soil. Now these issues can also be answered very easily by using this graph. So if I am finding out SSA where the soil is interacting with contaminant, its liquid limit is going to be different. So that means SSA will include this fundamental property also. The second relationship is uh, between the cation exchange capacity and the specific surface area. And here you will find that there is a good correlation between the specific surface area and cation exchange capacity. So more the specific surface area, fundamentally though it is a physical property, the activity of the clay is also going to be high. That means in simple words, cations have more parking lots available, is it not, on the surface of the grains. So more surface area, more cation exchange capacity. This is the relationship between activity of the soil and specific surface area, where you can see that if specific surface area is more, the activity is more. 
again uh, my idea of you know exposing these relationships to you is that you should you should realize the point that ssa should include you know physical chemical mineralogical properties when soil comes in contact with contaminants so this activity is going to be a bit different than the activity which you have studied in classical geomechanics where you talked about only plasticity index and percentage clay fraction so truly speaking this activity should be replaced by the word reactivity but we have to prove this right or wrong so we still need some more time so still we are using this as an activity word and we are saying that activity is a direct function of a specific surface area this was an attempt to check whether free soil index can be correlated with ssa so free soil index is a phenomena where soil swells because of its swelling property or mineralogical interaction so ssa also gets correlated quite well with free soil index of this soil so you can get liquid limit activity cation exchange capacity free soil index of the soil if you know ssa or vice versa now the question is why you should rely so much on ssa and i want to get an answer from you see any any curious mind will say why should we depend so much on ssa can you can you give me an answer to this question you are very close to the answer but not the precise answer yes please any other attempt how many techniques you used to determine ll only one how many techniques are available to determine ssa just count and tell me 2 plus 4 plus 3 at least 9 10 techniques and that too these are the methodologies which are you know very precisely instrumented so this is where the school of thought is that if we know ssa which can be obtained very easily in 21st century most of the testing in geotechnical engineering need not to be executed all right so this is the moral of the story a day should come when the characterization of the material should be done based on only one parameter either ssa or cation exchange capacity and you need not to do all these cumbersome tests which have been being followed in the laboratories since last 30 40 years well let me show you some more information on the application of cec and ssa on x axis i have plotted here wh now wh corresponds to hygroscopic moisture content to your knowledge is there any code which is available to determine hygroscopic moisture content of the soils but did you ever wonder that how to determine hygroscopic moisture content of the soils well so this was the question when one of my phd scholars dr paresh was working on his phd thesis and this is what was published in stm we came up with some equations where a specific surface area is linked to hygroscopic moisture content hygroscopic moisture content also is a phenomena where the moisture present in atmosphere simply gets associated with the grains of the soil so you remember one of the methods of adsorption was either gas or vapor so is the natural vapor which is present in the atmosphere getting adhered to the soil sample so this logic fits very well and what we notice is that the relationship between ssa and hygroscopic moisture content is almost linear so more hygroscopic moisture content shows more specific surface area so somewhere on this side you'll be having sands and on this side you'll be having active minerals so at least what we have done is we have mapped two extremes of the soils that is the minerals and the sands based on this type of a relationship similarly if you plot cation exchange capacity for which the units are milliequivalents per 100 grams with respect to wh 
more WH means more cation exchange capacity. Clear? So, CEC versus SSA we have already seen in the previous graph. So, these are the relationships which we get when you apply electrical energy field on the soil sample. This we will be discussing slightly later when we talk about electrical characterization of the soils. But just to give you an idea, I thought this is quite appropriate to put this equation here, where sigma h corresponds to the conductivity, electrical conductivity of the soil corresponding to hygroscopic moisture and sigma dry corresponds to conductivity of the dry soil. So, this ratio is also directly proportional to special surface area. And you must be seeing here k difference, this k difference is nothing but the dielectric property of the soil. So, difference in the dielectric coefficient or dielectric constant of the hygroscopic soil and the dry soil will give you k difference and this will also give you SSA. So, this is where most of the instrumentation is going on in present day you know electronics and instrumentation, where people want to determine the in situ moisture content just by inserting a probe into it. So, what that probe is doing? That probe is simply finding out the difference between the dielectric constants and the conductivity of the of the material to get the surface area or cation exchange capacity and so on. This work was published in ASTM International in 2006, Methodology for Determination of Hygroscopic Moisture Content of the Soil Mass. From this is where actually we got this concept of drying and wetting of the soil. So, you should appreciate a point when we talk about hygroscopic moisture content, this is a wetting cycle, clear. But if I want to take out the moisture from this, it becomes a drying cycle for which we may use these methods for degassing the soil sample and hence making it a dry material. Okay, I will stop here today. If you have any doubts, we can utilize the time. Yes, please. Which method give uh, correct value of SSA like of, of all these methods? Which value we should take for our experimental Normally, EGME gives you the best results. So, in this paper, we have shown that EGME gives the best possible results out of all the methods. And what is the reason? If you read that paper, you can follow better. And suitability of each method depends on like a or like sir, which method must be uh, adopted now for this situation is depends on actually? No, it will not depend on the type of the material because after working on different type of material, we realize that EGME gives you the results which are very close to the results which you get from sophisticated methods like using technometer and so on. But the problem is that every laboratory and everyone cannot afford such instruments. So, this is where we find that EGME gives us a reasonably good results as compared to the other methods, particularly BET and single point or multi point BETs. Any other question? The quickest method would be gas adsorption. And this gives you reasonably good results, but only thing is it will give you only surface area which is external. But if you want to get the total surface area, then you have to go for EGME. See most of the processes where chemisorption becomes very important, particularly the industry related with catalysts, you know, you cannot do away with EGME method, there is no way because this is where you have to ascertain the complete surface area which is exposed for interaction. So, you have to perform EGME test. Sorry? No, we have done for rock powders also. So, this is valid for all type of geomaterials. Yes, but the question is that crushing of the rock itself is a very abstract term, is it not? So, which fraction you are going to consider? But the same is valid for soils also. In soils also you have different ranges of the particles. So, this is where the genesis of the idea is to fractionize the material and then find out its activity. You see the material.
go for its components and then see which component is most reactive. Some people are required to answer these questions.